Okay, this is what I got for this week. So uh, I'm it. I'm uh, actually would be the new hope. I'm probably more of the old hope, but uh, that's what you get. So couldn't get my kids in. So before I was gonna do the big pan over to something, but uh, this took a while to set up for this. So. Okay. Uh, and the music. Okay. And and out. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I'm not dressed up, but I am showing my pride for my employer. Uh, okay, so. I suppose it's kind of science -y, you know, at the start. So, uh, today we're talking about the sun. Oh, again, I'm talking about the sun. You guys are probably, uh, oh, anyway. What? Ah. Okay. Uh, okay. So, hey, the sun. So we're actually going to start talking about stars. In particular, we're going to start talking about the best star, our sun. Um, and we're not going to talk about the principles I'm going to talk about here. Are actually, applicable to uh, all stars. So. Let's talk about the sun. So, some uh, basic uh, info or some background information. Okay, the, our sun is about, by guesstimates, about four and a half billion years old. It is estimated that its life is going to be about 10 billion years old. And you're probably asking, well, how do we know this? Um, we know this, or the guesstimation comes from the fact that we've observed other stars that are similar to our sun. And we know what type of star our sun is. And in looking at the kajillion of stars up in the sky, we've seen the, the stars like our sun at various stages of life. So we've got an estimate of about how long the star should live. And by where it is now and its size and its condition, we have an idea of about how old it is. So it is about four and a half billion years old, which is about half of its 10 billion life. So, uh, towards the end of its life, as I said, it's going to swell up. Um, actually, the sun has been slowly getting bigger. Uh, over the course of its life, well, it grows like you know, a lot of things grow, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, it is it is a uh, it is classified as a G two star. Uh, is other known as a yellow dwarf. Um, and what is interesting about this is it is kind of unusual in that it's solitary. Uh, about a little more than half or so of the stars in uh, the universe seem to be paired with other stars so that when they actually are born, they are born close enough to other stars that the gravitation of the two stars actually link them together. And so, ah, ooh, linked to Star Wars. So if you remember in the, the New Hope, uh, the first Star Wars movie made, uh, where Luke goes out trying to find, um, I think it's R2-D2 left. I think that's the scene. And he goes out, and they show the twin sons of Tatooine setting. That actually is not uncommon, or, you know, would be common, that you'd have uh, two sons, two or more sons. Uh, there are several stars uh, clusters in which there are several stars all linked together uh, gravitationally. So it's kind of unusual that our sun is solitary. They think that maybe 
uh, it was formed when the star went supernova and that explosion actually pushed our star out of its stellar nursery or the area where it was born with a lot of other stars because when we get to that uh, we will talk about the fact that uh, stars are born in clusters not individually so you typically get a large grouping of stars that are all about the same age uh, uh, astronomically speaking um, but uh, the fact that we're uh, alone we might have been jettisoned out because of some disturbance so okay um, it is basically a giant ball of hydrogen. The composition that they think right now is about 98% hydrogen, 2% helium. Um, this actually is pretty nice because the fact that it is basically all just hydrogen, one type of element, makes it easy to model. Uh, we don't have to get complicated with a lot of other things. It's just a giant ball of hydrogen. So it makes trying to interpret or understand what, how this behaves and, and, and what the structure is like pretty easy because it is just uh, one big ball of hydrogen. And as we talked about before, it was created out of a giant gas cloud that compressed down into this. So, uh, this begs the question then, um, well, it doesn't really beg the question, but the, the only thing the sun is really doing is creating energy. It's a giant gas ball. It's super hot and it's pumping out energy. So really the only question then is, how is it doing that? How is it putting out all the energy that it's got? And so that really is kind of the only, or the big, and only question about the sun, the energy. Where does it come from? Okay. So, oh, and I love this. Um, one of the textbooks, and I, and I love how in, in science textbooks, uh, they try to attempt to give you uh, a reference that you could understand. And I love this because in this book it said, in one second, I get that, the sun produces the energy of four trillion hydrogen bombs. That doesn't help me understand uh, the amount of energy the sun produces because the only thing I, oh no, there's two things I get. I get one second and four out of that. So I have never lit off a hydrogen bomb so I don't have any reference as to how much that is. Plus hydrogen bombs, um, vary in size. So you could have a big bomb, you could have a little bomb. So I have no idea what size bomb that is. And trillion is a number that I swear is made up. Um, I have no reference to that. Uh, I think literally probably a thousand is the only thing I can kind of grasp. Past that, it just becomes abstract. So that whole reference and trying to make me understand how big it is, no, it doesn't work. They could have just made up numbers for that. So. And I think that is one of the problems with, you know, immense, actually super tiny and super big is that the human brain doesn't actually comprehend that. We're, we deal with sizes that are very relative to us. So you get bigger or smaller and it, it doesn't, I don't think it clicks. You can, you can really kind of understand that. So, um, how does, it make all that energy. Okay, so the theories. The first was just simple gravitational contraction. Traction. Okay, that means I got a huge, super big dust cloud. Okay, might have been like a thousand uh, light years across or more, 100,000 light years. It's huge. And so over time, and gravity pulled all of this together. So, you know, the gravity of all these things slowly pulled and it came down, and all of that 
scrunched up into a tiny little ball. Well, and I think as I've uh, we've talked before, I'll say it again, if you if you spread something, if you take energy and you spread it out, that's going to feel cooler. So even though this cloud might have a total energy of uh, I just, I, an arbitrary, let's say 100. If I have it like this, it's going to feel real cool if you're inside it because the 100 is way spread out. And so having each little particle hit you, you're barely only going to be hit by maybe one or two way out here because it's so spread out. You're going to feel cold because you're not getting a whole lot of energy. I compress it in a tiny little ball. It's going to be super hot because all that energy now is packed in. If you touch that, you're going to have a gazillion molecules hitting you, it feels hotter. So the first theory was the idea that it was just simply squishing the whole thing down and it's just slowly releasing heat. Um, well, in modeling that and the physics of that, it, it doesn't work. It would not be producing the amount of energy that it is over <clears throat> this amount of time. For five billion years, it probably would have cooled off. So it can't be this because um, it's just, it's been too much time and it's too hot. So, uh, it's too much time and it is too hot. Okay. So, the other theory when was nuclear fusion. Okay, so now we're going to sidetrack a little bit because I've got to talk about the difference between because there's two ways that you can get nuclear energy. There is fusion and then there is fission. Okay. Yeah, and it's kind of critical that you understand the difference between this. Um, one of these is easy, one of these is really hard. So fusion is, uh, sorry, this, this one. Fusion is combining atoms. Okay, so with fusion, you're fusing or combining atoms to make a new bigger atom. Um, the most, well, and in this case, the one that we do know happens is taking hydrogen atoms, smashing them together to create. Uh, a helium atom. So you're going, and I'll, I'm going to get to this in um, uh, a little bit because I'm going to uh, relate how that happens in here. Uh, so you smash these together to create uh, a bigger um, atom. Fission is actually splitting an atom. Okay, and that is the type of energy that we currently do now, the atomic bomb, atomic uh, power plants. Um, that is through fission. And with fusion, you actually take the smallest atoms you can, which would be hydrogen, and smash those together. That's easy. You build something up easy. With fission, you take the biggest atom that, <clears throat> excuse me, the biggest atom you can, and you split that apart. And uranium is what they use for this. The problem with uranium is it's pretty unstable to begin, or actually the good part for, for fission is it's pretty unstable. The bad part for us is it's unstable. Uh, it actually comes apart on its own um, for reasons that are, I don't quite follow the, the bonds between in the nucleus to hold the neutrons and protons are kind of weak and it comes apart. Uh, you put a lot of it together and they bombard each other and you get a chain reaction and they'll Part. You can actually, if you got pure uranium and you got enough of it and put it together, it would explode. You could just make a, an atomic bomb by simply packing enough of it together, it'll, it'll uh, run away chain react. So that's the difference here. So you're splitting an atom versus uh, fusing them together. This one is easy to do at normal conditions. Okay, if you get the material, 
you can actually do it fairly. I mean, you don't, it's room temperature, room pressure. Uh, you just get the material, actually, if you get enriched uranium, so you get the uranium that's unstable, not the stuff that's already split apart. You put enough of it together, uh, it's going to start. One will split, and it'll send a piece into another kind of a domino effect. It'll cause it to split, which will send a couple pieces. And the big trick there, and which is what happens in um, nuclear power plants, is you've got to regulate that. Uh, and what they do is they put, uh, they make a big grid of uranium with uh, carbon control rods. And the carbon actually will absorb the little pieces that come off the, the little uh, subatomic particles that come off the uranium. And the more you lower the carbon in, the more it absorbs those uh, uh, reaction pieces and stops it from domino effecting. You pull those rods up, it allows them to fly and and uh, react. So the control rods lifting and lowering basically allow the uh, control how quickly you get that reaction. So uh, fusion on the other hand requires super high temperatures and pressures. So you need temperatures in the millions of, of Kelvin. So I think uh, the minimum you need is something like 7 million Kelvin and you need pressures in the millions of pounds per square inch. So you've got to really squeeze these gases super close together. You've got to heat them enough because basically you've got to heat them enough and have them close enough that they'll slam into each other and actually bond. So, so super high temperatures and pressures. That makes this extremely difficult to do in any situation other than, say, at the center of a, of a star. Because in the center of the star, the gravity is, you've got a huge gravity and pressure that's squeezing it down, um, and it contains it. Uh, on Earth, there's no material that we could, we could use that, uh, to recreate the center of a, of a star core. Doesn't mean we can't do fusion, but we can't do fusion like what we think happens at the center of a star. So we'd have to do it some other way. Um, in terms of material, uh, the material that we need for fission is dangerous. The byproduct is also dangerous. So, and it's rare. So the material is rare and powerful. So uranium is an extremely rare uh, element on Earth. It was very heavy. Most of the uranium that we would have on Earth is at the core. Very little of it in the crust where we can get at it. Um, it's extremely harmful. It's radioactive. Uh, you really can't be around a whole lot of it. You can't put a whole lot of it together. Um, when, you, uh, when uranium slits apart, um, I don't know exactly what it becomes. But what, plutonium, maybe? I don't know. I gotta look it back up. But whatever the, the waste is, is radioactive and harmful. And I'm sure you've heard in the news the whole idea of what do we do with the waste. <clears throat> the material for this is uh, cheap and common. Which is great because what's the material that you're using? Hydrogen. That is the most common element in the whole universe. It is uh, not harmful at all. And the byproduct is helium. And who doesn't love helium for balloons and talking funny? So this is one of the benefits is, is if we can come up with a way of, of creating fusion, uh, the, the uh, fuel is extremely cheap and easy to get. And um, the byproduct isn't harmful at all. No. Uh, that's the difference. Fusion is combining, fission is splitting it up. Okay. So, um, oh. So, how do we, uh, ooh, 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 there was something in the news. Um, I think it's Princeton thinks that they, have, they might have a fusion reactor that's actually going to generate more energy than it takes to produce. Uh, anyway. There are a couple of fission reactors that um, they're working on um, right now. So there's a couple different types. So how do we recreate this? Well, my favorite is one, and it's probably the one you see most. Like. It's called a tokamak reactor. 
And it basically, it's like a giant donut. So if I, if I cut this in half, so it's a big donut brain. So you're whizzing stuff around. And the way that they, they make this, this reactor work is they line the sides with magnets. And these magnets basically create a magnetic field and keep the hydrogen spinning around in the middle. So it's not touching any sides. And so you isolate it in the middle. It's a vacuum. You can whiz it around. And these magnets also whip the hydrogen around. And they get it up to relevant relativistic speed so getting up to speeds that are that are approaching you know fractions of the speed of light so that fast um, and then basically what they do is they whip one around really 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 fast and then they put a bunch of hydrogen or a couple of hydrogens in the way and have it smashed together and when it smashes boom releases a bunch of energy uh, the problem with this is it takes more energy to to create the explosion than you get out of it. So if it takes like 10 units of energy to get the explosion, they're only getting like eight back. That's not um, effective when it takes more energy in your power plant than you get out of your power plant. So supposedly they're better than this. The other way I've heard they do is take a little box, fill it with hydrogen, and they've got this like huge... Uh, almost like a uh, basketball arena full of lasers, a bunch of different lasers, all shooting at this little box at the same time, and the lasers heat and compress the hydrogen at once, boom, it explodes. Again, problem with that is it is way more energy than what you're getting out. So, back to the sun. Fusion is what we're talking about. So, combining uh, Okay, so, okay, uh, to get a pause here, because I think i got to set up a picture for this, so. Okay, I'm back, just a minute, here I come. Okay, so I believe uh, in the case of the sun, it is fusing hydrogen into helium. Okay, and the way that they believe they do that is by the proton proton chain. Okay, that is the, um, so, okay, so that is what I was trying to set up, so come with me, let's take a look, let's see some pictures, pictures, you're up there, sorry. Uh, I need a pointy stick. Uh, where are all the yardsticks? Took the yardsticks. Rack farts. Okay, so the point with frustrating. Okay, uh, point. so this is the proton proton chain. This is what they think actually happens. And so you have one hydrogen, and actually at this point, the hydrogen is plasma, so it doesn't even have an electron with it. Um, actually, none of these things have electrons. Oh, I got my stick right here. So you've got two basically protons, and that's what this little one here is, is indicating, that it is just a, a proton. Two protons slam into each other, and I guess it takes that much time, but I'm not worried about the time. And when they slam together, um, it turns into a st still hydrogen. One of these is a proton, one of these is a neutron, and what is produced here is a, uh, an electron with a positive charge, not a negative charge. So you've got a positron, I believe is what it's called, is created in an object called a neutrino. We'll get back to the neutrino in a minute. 
but these two things are created when this turns from a proton into a neutron. And so I've got a heavy hydrogen. So a hydrogen is normally just an electron and a proton. In this case now, it is an, a proton with a neutron, which is a neutral element. Now, another hydrogen at this point slams into it. And when that is hit, you now have a, a small helium. It's not quite a full helium because a full helium is two protons and two neutrons. This is two protons, but it's only got one neutron and the gamma radiation is produced. This is where the majority of the energy uh, is created from the sun. So the big heat comes, uh, the big energy source here is when this slams together produces the gamma radiation, that photon that comes off the form of, of gamma ray. Now at this point, another one of these helium threes, light heliums, they hit together. When that happens, they create a helium. And the byproduct then is outshoots two hydrogens. Now, I don't expect you to uh, memorize this, this, but I'm just showing you the process. And it's kind of, it's a surprisingly difficult process uh, complicated and it seems to take uh, a bunch of years for one individual to happen. But this is the process that, that is created. Now, one of the problems um, with this is how did, yeah, okay, so scientists theorized that this was happening and other scientists rightly said, okay, um, so this is what's happening in the sun. How do you prove this? I mean, you've come up with this theory, you've mapped this out, but what is your proof that this is actually happening in the sun? Because I could say that it's a bunch of hamsters spinning in a wheel uh, generating all this heat. You know, you, your theory is no good if you don't have evidence to back it up. And so these guys are like, well, it's producing a lot of energy. That's fine. You know, you go with the gamma rays coming out, Lots of things can produce gamma rays. You heat anything hot enough, it'll produce gamma rays. You could if I heated you up enough. So they looked at saying, okay, is there anything unique about this process, something that we could say only happens with fusion, and that would be our piece of evidence. And you go back to not the positron, but this neutrino. And this subatomic particle neutrinos only are created through fusion. That's the, well, that's the only way we know of, of them being created. So they said, okay, if we can detect neutrinos, then we can have some evidence that this is what's being created. The problem with neutrinos is that they are extremely small and they basically fly through all matter without ever interacting. It's very rare that one will actually react or hit something. So they're so tiny, they're flying through the gaps between um, atoms. So in between the uh, nucleus and the electron, they're flying right through. In fact, they uh, theorize that in one square centimeter, so if you draw a, a centimeter by a centimeter square, and you draw that, let's say if I draw that on the board over there, um, that every second there are 65 billion neutrinos flying through there, not ever reacting. So there are lots of neutrinos flying through the universe, and they're flying through not interacting with anything, so from all the different fusion reactions. So the difficulty then for scientists was they had to come up with some way of detecting it. So they had to make a neutrino detector. And it's very the details that basically uh, they had to use fluid uh, kind of like um, uh, dry cleaning fluid, so this is heavy fluid, and just put a bunch of sensors waiting to see if they could detect a collision. And they waited and waited. They built one of these inside a mountain, isolated it away from other stuff, and they waited and waited and waited and waited. And finally, they did get a collision. And the collision, kind of like watching where a bullet was coming from, so as it streaked through, they could actually trace it and say, yes, it's aiming towards the sun. And so they have detected neutrinos coming from the sun. And so they did get evidence to support the idea that it is fusion that's going on. And it's the neutrino that actually is the evidence for that. So let's go back.
So. Okay. So it takes four hydrogens to eventually make one helium in a long process for that. And the evidence to support this was uh, neutrinos. So the detection of neutrinos coming from the direction of the sun was the evidence to support this theory, which is, uh, I guess, still technically a theory, but more and believed that that actually is what it is. Um, it is interesting, the sun, I mean, just to give you an idea of how for 5 billion years, the sun has been taking about 5 million tons of hydrogen each second and fusing it into helium. That is a boatload that it's been doing for a gazillion years. So that is just a mind boggling amount and number uh, of what it's doing. So now the other interesting thing about this, and we'll get to this in a minute, is only 30% of the sun is going to be used for this. So for all this whole process, when the sun finally dies, it will only have fused 30% of its uh, total mass in this. So 10 billion years is only 30% of it. So again, it's a kind of a super massive uh, amount. So that's how it's making its energy through fusion. Now we got to look at look at the interior. Okay, so what's happening in the sun? Uh, so before we do that, um, since this is just a giant ball of gas, we need to understand a little bit about how gases behave. And so to look at this and say, okay, what's going on? What's the structure like? We need to understand how, how, how do gases behave? And for that, we're gonna look at the ideal gas law. Okay, so uh, the ideal gas law is actually P, B, equals N R T, where V equals pressure, V equals volume, N equals, let me double check that, this is the amount of your gas that you have, R is your gas constant depending on the type of gas that you have, so this uh, different gases kind of behave in different ways. So whether you, you know, what your gas is, that's your so the gas constant. So how it behaves, and then T is temperature. Okay, we're not interested in the amount of gas. We're not interested in the type of gas because we're only looking at at um, uh, relationships here. So if I get rid of that, I have that PV equals the pressure times volume equals temperature. Um, I don't like that equation the way it is, so I'm going to change this up because I want a ratio and a relationship between these three is a little bit easier to understand. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide that by T. What I do on one side of an equation, I have to do on the other, so I'm going to divide that by T. This cancels out to 1, so what I can get is PV over T, pressure times volume over temperature, equals 1 or basically a constant. And what I mean by that is that now this ratio here has to always be the same. What do I mean? Okay, so we got P, B over T equals one. Okay, let's substitute numbers in for that. So let's say P is 10, B is 10, T would have to be, I don't know if you can do the math, would have to be 100. Okay, so what I'm saying here is if I change any one of these other variables, the other variables have to change to compensate to always keep this one. So for instance, if I dropped P to 5, well, this is now 50 over 100, this would either have to change to 50 or the back at 100, this would have to change to 20. Okay, so I got a relationship here 
about how pressure, volume, and temperature all react if one changes, one or more change. That's what we're going to talk about right now. So, is how those change. So, what is the relationship of those? So, let's go over here. E times V times T equals 1. Assign numbers to these. So I think that makes it easier to, to understand that. Okay, so now, one of the problems I have with this equation is I've got three variables. Okay, so if I change this, this one could change, or that one could change, or a combination of the two could change. And the bigger problem here is if, yeah, I do this, and this changes to 20, uh, bu, 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 bu. yeah, I'm, I'm, I gotta pick it. Well, I could change this maybe to seven and this to, you know, something else. So, to make it balance. Uh, seven times 20 is 100. This could be 140. That would be seven. So, then equals. So, but that's too complicated. So, what I'm going to try to do to illustrate this is just, we're going to just change one variable at a time. So, Let's start off and let's say we're not going to change pressure. I'm going to keep this constant. Okay, so what is the relationship between volume and temperature to each other? Okay, so how do I have a constant pressure situation? I got a balloon. Hey, with a balloon, it's always going to have a pressure of 15 pounds. So there's always 15 pounds uh, per square inch, or one atmosphere. There's always going to be 15 pounds pushing on the outside. And if my balloon is not moving, so the, the balloon's not getting bigger, not getting smaller, then it's indicating that it's in equilibrium. And if it's in equilibrium, it must mean the pressure on the inside is equal to the pressure on the outside outside is equal to the pressure on the inside. And so it's got to be 15 pounds here. I blow a balloon up. Whoop. As it gets bigger, the pressures aren't equal. But as soon as it stops moving, it is, it is equal. So in this case, we can say the pressure is going to be equal. Not instantaneously, but when we finish. So thinking about that, pressures are the same. Now, I take and I heat my, this balloon up. So, I increase the temperature here. So, this temperature goes up. Now, let's say I double it. Well, what we're picturing in here, I've got a bunch of molecules. Right now, they're pushing at 15 pounds, and this is pushing at 15 pounds. I heat them up and add energy. What's going to happen? Well, they're instantaneously their pressure is going to get great. They're going to start pushing more. They're going to spread out. And so they're going to make the balloon bigger, spread out until the pressure on the inside is 15 pounds equal to the pressure on the outside. So for that split second, you think about the pressures changing until it equals out again. But what happens to the volume? You should see this. The volume's got to go up. If something on the bottom goes up, it's got to match it on the top. This volume is going to go up to 20. So what we know is going to happen is my balloon has got to get bigger as these molecules spread out more. So it expands. So the volume is that if the temperature goes up, the volume's got to go up. And so in this case, there, these are directly related to each other. One goes up, the other goes up. If it goes down, if I cool the balloon, that goes down, well, the opposite's got to happen here. That's got to go down to match that. So, in this case with pressure it's held constant, what happens to one, what happens to volume has to happen to temperature. What happens to temperature has to happen to volume. It goes up. The other goes up. It goes down. The other goes down. So just like my balloon, I cool my balloon off. The molecules push less. They're not pushing as more. The pressure on the outside is going to shrink them. 
K. So let's reset that equation. Okay, now we're going to hold volume constant. This one's easy. Well, I just got a bottle. Okay, plug up the bottle. Got a bunch of molecules in here. I heat that up. You guys should know what's going to happen here. The pressure inside the bottle is going to get greater. So the volume isn't changing. It's a bottle. I'm holding that constant. But now the molecules are bouncing around even more. They can't expand, so the pressure increases. So temperature goes up to 200. The pressure goes up. What happens on the bottom of the equation has to equal what happens on the top. Top, bottom have to equal in this equation. So the pressure is going to increase. So I keep heating it up, pressure gets better. I cool this off. Now, like when you take a soda bottle, you put it in the fridge, it comes out crinkly. Well, that's because now it's done the opposite. So if the temperature decreases, just like with volume, then the pressure would have to decrease too. Oop, oop, it's got to go down. So, okay, pretty good. Okay, now we set the equations. We got one more to do. We're going to hold temperature constant. Okay, so easy way to think about this. Bike pump. Now let's say we're pumping up a basketball. It's easier to draw than a whole bicycle. So. Okay, so what's happening here? The temperature not going to change. And it does, but for our argument, we're going to say it doesn't. Okay, so the temperature stays constant. I am going to push down on this. And so this is going to decrease. I decrease the volume, pressure goes up. Look back over here. If I decrease the volume, so now that's a five, like I cut it in half, the pressure has to, has to do the inverse, has to do the opposite to balance that equation. The volume goes down, and you think about it, it should make sense. If I decrease the volume, it's gonna, the molecules are all going to push a whole lot more. The opposite, if I increase the volume, pressure is going to go down. They're spread out. They're not going to push as much. And so a bicycle pump, the principle behind a bicycle pump is, say, the pressure inside here is 30. I've got to push this down. It starts at 15. I've got to push this down until this reaches 30 point something. So just over 30. Once there's now more pressure here and less pressure here, the molecules are actually going to go to where there's less. It balances it out. And why it becomes harder and harder to pump is because now once this gets to 31, I've got to push down a little bit more to reach that point, and then a little bit more, and a little bit more. And you're going to get to a point where you can't push down anymore. The, you can't squeeze it enough. The pump's not good enough. It's not going to create a, an imbalance to push it over. Okay. So, that is, in a nutshell, the ideal gas law. Okay. So, we can get to the ideal gas law in just a minute. I've got to put it all together. But the other thing I've got to talk about is something called hydrostatic equilibrium. And hydrostatic equilibrium is the balance of what was the thing about this. Equilibrium, we know, means a balance. Static, I hope you do know, which is unchanging. And then hydro, I guess it's liquid or gas. So, so this is a gas uh, unchanging balance. And I think of it kind of that way. Ah, uh, okay. So I got a little picture for that one to help me out with that. So, 
Let's go. Okay, so I know this isn't a complicated picture, but uh, bear in me drawing. So the balance of forces in the sun that are hydrostatic equilibrium, it's gravity, which is the uh, black dot, or the black arrow, pushing down, so pushing in. And pressure of the, the molecules all pushing back, pushing out. And so the hydrostatic equilibrium, because the sun isn't changing, it must be imbalanced. If we were to watch it expand, it wouldn't be imbalanced. If we watch it contract, it wouldn't be imbalanced. But it is imbalanced. And as you go down deeper, the balance actually changes. So up here, gravity is not that strong because there's not a lot of molecules here. Gravity doesn't have a, remember, gravity is based on mass. The more mass you have, the more gravity you're going to have. So there's not a lot of mass. There's not a lot of stuff here for gravity to be really strong. There's also, because gravity's not squeezing it really tight, the pressure isn't really strong. So as gravity put, you know, squeezes, it squeezes stuff tighter and tighter until it pushes back. And so the gravity here has pushed it down to this point that the pressure of the molecules balances it. Now here, the gravity is going to be stronger. There's more stuff above it, so the gravity pushes down more. The pressure, because this isn't moving, the pressure is equal. It's, it's crushed it down even smaller. Here, more gravity, smaller compression, the pressure is greater. When you get towards the core of gravity, all of this stuff pushing down, it's compressed this even smaller, it pushes back even more. Now, in a snapshot of the sun, there it is in balance. But we're going to talk about the fact that it isn't actually in balance. It is slowly changing. So I will get to that right now. Okay, so this is the balance between gravity pushing inward and pressure pushing outward. Okay, gravity is based on mass, pressure is based on the uh, molecular interaction. The closer molecules are, the more pressure they ping off each other. Uh, okay, so um, I will say, and we're going to get to this in a minute, it's also pressure plus um, Fusion from the core, and I'm going to add that here. But I'm going to, we're going to come back to that in a minute because you've got the explosion and the release of all that energy from the core, which adds to uh, the pressure pushing out. Outside of the core, you don't have this fusion, but the fusion from the core is real close to where it is. Farther out, you don't have that. It's just uh, the pressure. Okay. So, and this is something, I'm, what we're going to talk about right now is the process of how the sun changes throughout its life based on this. This is, I'm going to go over this over and over several times as we talk about stars because this is an important process to remember about the life of stars. So, let's combine the whole thing here. So the center of the star, we have the core. The core is where the temperatures and the pressures have actually gotten hot enough that we can have fusion. Outside here, not enough. So fusion's not going to occur out here. It's only going to occur in the core. You've got to squeeze it down tighter and tighter and tighter. 
And so this is where fusion takes place. In a snapshot of the sun, the core, like every other part of the sun, is in hydrostatic equilibrium. The gravity pushing down is equal to the pressure pushing out. And in this case, this is pressure plus the fusion of what's going on. So it's the combination of those two in the core. So it's at a balance point. So you take a snapshot. As I said, it's, it is slowly changing. But you take a snapshot, I've got pressure and fusion pushing out, holding back against gravity collapsing. The problem that I've got is in the core, when I'm fusing, so what's happening in the core, so take a look at the core, I've got all of these hydrogens. So these are hydrogens, but it takes four hydrogens will combine into one helium. Now you say, okay, you took four, you, you know, you haven't changed anything. Um, you know, this is a, a big one. The problem is, and this is size-wise, this is what a helium looks like, or a hydrogen looks like. It is, in the nucleus is one proton, and out in the electron shell is one electron. Now, a helium has two electrons, and four, uh, in two protons and, and two neutrons, it's got four uh, subatomic particles in the center. It's the same size. So its electron shell is the same size. So what's happening in the core is when four hydrogens combine into one helium, I've in essence lost three particles pushing out. So the mass is the same. It's the same amount of stuff. I just made a denser particle. But that's one particle that can push back instead of three. And so what I'm doing in the case of fusion is I am decreasing the pressure. So, or the volume. There aren't as many particles to pull out. I'm decreasing the pressure first. Because what's happening is then I, I now had 10. Now I just replace that with one. So there aren't as many pushing back. So if there aren't as many pushing back, gravity is going to be stronger force, and it's going to decrease the uh, it's going to decrease the volume. Now in this case, what's going to happen if I go back to pressure, volume, temperature? So I decrease the volume. It's actually going to increase the pressure. And I know this is a little complicated because now I've got three variables. Oh, I don't know if you can see that. So let's do that over here. So now, P, V, T. Now, this is a little complicated, but because I don't have as many particles, uh, the pressure is less. Gravity then squeezes it down. So I, I just, the first thing I do is I disrupted the hydrostatic equilibrium. The pressure's not the same. Gravity is going to uh, be bigger than the pressure. So gravity is going to squeeze the core down. The volume is going to go down of the core, which is going to cause the pressure to go up. And so now the pressure is going to go up. So it squeezes it down until the pressure is balanced again. So it's at hydrostatic equilibrium again. But the pressure is going to be close, is going to be tied to in this case the temperature and as that pressure goes up the temperature is going to come up with it so related to those two and i know this is the problem where you've got three variables and you've got a couple of things going on but the volume changes the pressure the pressure then is kind of related to the temperature and the temperature comes up and so this gets hotter as this gets hotter it increases the fusion rate and so now the fusion rate is going to burn, burn more to compensate for the loss of pressure to hold back gravity. Okay. This is happening at all stars. And so I'm going to go over this now. 
uh, you know, with that. So, what's the implication then for a star? Okay, so when a star is first born, got a real big core. It's got all its stuff in the core. So as it takes, as fusion takes place, it loses material. So it's got, it's turning now three, four, it takes four hydrogens to make one helium. So you're losing three hydrogens constantly. And so the core is getting smaller. So the core shrinks. But as it shrinks, the pressures increase and temperature increases. So this shrinks and this gets hotter. And the fusion rate increases. So if you think about this, I've got a core and there's gravity pushing down on it because this mass out here doesn't change. That gravity is pretty constant. That mass pushing down on the core is the same. And so this thing is getting smaller and it's burning hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. To to push back against that gravity, it's got to keep that gravity at bay. And because I don't have as many molecules now, the fusion rate is actually going to compensate. So it's got to burn hotter and faster to, to push out more energy to keep that gravity. So it's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller as it gets hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter, burning faster and faster and faster and faster. So when it first starts off, it's slow. It doesn't need to have a whole lot of fusion. It's got a lot of particles. But then it starts to shrink and the fusion kicks in faster to compensate and faster and faster to compensate, compensate, burns hotter and hotter and hotter. What that does is there is then more energy or more heat coming out of the core, which actually causes the star to expand. So through the course of the sun's life, just like any other star, the core is actually getting smaller as it's burning up material, but it's getting hotter. And the hotter, you think of this as like a source inside a balloon, this hotter core is heating up the gases on the outside, which is causing these gases to expand more, which is actually causing the star to get bigger or the sun to get bigger. Now, our sun is going to get dramatically bigger. So it might start off like this big. Um, it's going to end up being like that big. So it is going to go through a gigantic expansion. Now, what happens then is as this expands, the outer layer of the sun actually gets cooler. And that's because even though the core in here, which is now tiny, uh, is now tiny, is super hot, that energy spread over the, the whole outside is kind of cooled off. So it's going to go from being yellow, which is hotter, to red, which is cooler. Now, it's a, a drop in temperature on the outside of maybe a couple thousand degrees, but it's noticeably different. So it's not super big temperature drop, but it is a noticeable drop. So we're going to start off as a start off as a yellow dwarf. We're going to end up as a red giant, a lot cooler planet. I mean, star, excuse me, because it's expanded and cooled off. So, in the life of a star, like our sun, it is going to be smaller with a bigger core. So it's got a smaller overall size, it's got a bigger core. And in the core, the fusion rate is slower. And the temp and pressure are lower. Then through the course of the life, as it loses this material, It gets bigger overall. Because the core got smaller. And 
diffusion got faster because the temp and pressure are higher. And I probably should have reversed those so the core gets smaller, temperature pressure get higher, which causes the fusion rate to get faster. And that is going to keep going. So this whole, whole idea, the sun was actually uh, at its smallest size um, and actually a hotter surface temperature uh, when it was born. And the surface temperature has actually gotten cooler, although it's actually putting out more energy because it's bigger. And there's a lot of things going on here. So smaller, smaller surface area wasn't putting out as much heat. The surface temperature was actually warmer. As it gets bigger, it's got a bigger surface. It's pumping out more heat and energy, although its overall surface temperature is lower. Um, so I know that's a lot. Uh, I know I did such a good job explaining that nobody's going to have any questions on that. Because, um, yeah, I'm that good. OK. So that leaves then, um, so that's talking about how the, the actual layers uh, inside the sun. So. Get the core. Radiative zone. And then the convective zone. And yep, you're right. I got cool pictures. Actually, I've got pictures that are going to be way easier to look at than for where did I take my. Uh, take my pointing stick. so degrees. This is dominated by fusion and this has just got energy blasting out of it. And so this is the only place that fusion can take place. It's the only place where the pressure is great enough and uh, the temperatures are great enough uh, to do that. None of the other material in the sun will actually make it into the core because the energy blasting out of it is so strong it pushes back the hydrogens. That hydrogen can't fall into the core. Um, if it weren't for the rest of this uh, gas around there, the core would actually blow itself apart. Um, it is the, the gravitational pressure holding it together, which keeps the core from actually blowing itself apart. Um, and we'll talk about that later where there's cases where, you know, that does happen. It can't. So then you have the radiative zone. The radiative zone, uh, still in the millions of degrees, is dominated by the radiation coming out of uh, the, the core. And this doesn't mix. This is all just kind of like salmon swimming upstream. It's trying to come in here. Radiation is blowing it back. So there's really no mixing. Now, when you get farther out, the pressures, temperatures drop. You get the convective zone. And you actually get material, um, as this gets heated, rise up. And then when it gives off heat, cools back down, you get a little uh, convection cycles. And that, in fact, you get a lot of convection cycles, which will lead to the light spots and the dark spots. So places where you have uh, brighter spots on here are where you have hot gases rising, where you have the dark spots is where you have cold uh, gases sinking. Um, it gives the, the sun a surface, a granular uh, picture, kind of looks like it's staticky. But it is just constantly these gases circling up and sinking back down and circling up, sinking back down. These hot spots right here are part of the magnetic field. Um, we'll get to that in just a minute from uh, magnetic flares. There are gases that are even more heated. And you can see there's a, a flare up here. It's because the magnetic field is interrupting 
the flow of gases going up and down, it's actually bottling up the gases, making that really, really hot. It's holding them down. We'll get to that in a minute. But here, if I, I go back to, I, I go back to this, I've got my core in the, oh, this doesn't really happen. I have this one. Okay. Now, I'll go back to this. Um, the surface of the sun really isn't a surface to speak of. It is the part of the sun that's actually giving off visible light. So it appears to us to be a surface because, you know, like this TV or whatnot, it appears to, to it's something that light is coming off of or coming from. So it appears to be, you know, a, uh, a surface. But that is just the top of the convective layer or the photosphere, the part giving off light. Um, there are a couple other layers after that that um, you know, scientists look at. There's the uh, chromosphere, which is kind of like the uh, atmosphere of it. Then there is the corona, which is kind of the loose, thin gases that surround the sun. Gravity's still trying to pull them in, but they they uh, they vary quite a bit. So, you know, in the in the in the drawing here, your corona can be widely varying as it kind of, and, and it's mostly affected by the uh, magnetic field, so. Uh, okay. Yeah. Taking my marker with my okay. core. This represents about 30% uh, or so uh, of the sun. And this is the only place for fusion. And the temperatures in here are like 15 million Kelvin. Radiative zone, this goes uh, from the core out to about 70% of the sun. And here it's about 2 million Kelvin. And this is uh, dominated by radiation from the core. And the convective zone is the last 30. And this, Where the heck did I take that pen? I did take it over here. <laughs> and this is where you have convection of hot and cool gases. And that gives surface granular appearance. Okay. And this is about six thousand. Kelvin. Okay, so the surface would be the photosphere. Photo meaning light, and sphere meaning sphere. So it's the layer that, that gives off light. Um, and so, you know, that's the, the surface uh, that we see. Um, 
I tell you, it, as I showed you in the pictures, it appears granular. Um, and then, uh, okay, so. And this is uh, Gibbs off visible light. This is kind of the surface we see. Uh, and I'll get to the sunspots uh, in a minute because that has to do with the magnetic. Uh, then you've got chromosphere. And the chromosphere, you know, if you want to think of it as kind of like the atmosphere, it extends about a thousand miles above the photosphere. Uh, it's not dense enough to see, but it is very hot due to the magnetic field heating up the gases. So uh, it's a thin like an atmosphere. And it is 30,000 Kelvin due to the magnetic field. And then you have the corona, lastly, and this is irregular, thin. Uh, it extends millions, or can extend millions of miles and this is got, is, can be up to 2 million Kelvin, again due to magnetic field. I don't want to rewrite it. So. Okay, uh, solar flares and coronal mass ejections. Um, let me show you pictures there. So, solar flares and coronal mass ejections. Okay, what happens is uh, the sun's got a huge magnetic field, extremely powerful magnetic field. The problem with the sun is that the sun being a gas, the gas doesn't all rotate at the same speed, not like a solid object like Earth. And because it doesn't rotate at the same speed, here I'm showing you a, a magnetic line that comes out, it gets twisted, where this rotates faster so the magnetic line that you would have just going across here, it gets wrapped around and it gets twisted. And what happens is the, basically the magnetic field gets all discombobulated and twisted up because of the weird rotation uh, or the, the differing rotation of the sun, the fact that it rotates faster here uh, at the equator than it does. And then these uh, magnetic field lines will actually come out of the surface. So as they're twisting around, they'll pop out. Where they come out of the surface, the magnetic field lines, in some cases, will bottle up gases. And when they bottle up the gases, um, depending on the type of field line, sometimes the gases will, will cool off on the surface and you will get a real hot uh, so it, it bottles up the gas. The surface gas cools off, but then you have a bottling of super hot gases underneath it. And so here actually is an eruption uh, of those where they finally come out. But that's a field line that this field line might be popping out and joining with this one. And the gases aren't allowed to come to the surface, so the surface gas is cool. The gases underneath it are super hot, and they're going to bubble up and at some point they're going to explode. And when they explode, they will rupture. And if you notice, it's not falling back, it's actually falling, following the magnetic field lines. So this gas is just hydrogen gas. It's not very heavy, but 
the magnetic field line is so strong, it's attached to it. So the stuff flares up and it drops back down. Now, sometimes some of that material, or no, not sometimes, some of that material does leave and get jettisoned out into space. And that material that gets jettisoned out into space is important because when you have a lot of solar activity, a lot of solar flares, coronal mass ejections, that material that's blown out, there's more of it heading towards Earth. It is damaging to uh, satellites and uh, to our atmosphere to a lesser extent. It also creates those, those more material, more auroras. So, those field lines, so here, now, for whatever reason, this is not understood by science, the, the sunspots do work in an about 11 year cycle. You get more sunspots happening about every 11 years. They're not, they don't know why that is happening, it does. Um, but those sunspots are just the magnetic field lines bottling up material. So um, this is, okay, so this is trying to, to demonstrate, this down here is a little dot is what the sun is, um, okay, this is what the sun is right now. So this is what it's gonna become possibly when it becomes a, a red giant. So that's going out to 2 AU. That is past swallowing up Earth. And um, the, that would actually be swallowing up Mars too. So that is possible as the largest size that it can get to before it dies off. Um, before it does that, that would be the view from Earth as it's starting to swell up. We're gonna have a super big sun. So, um, We'll be dead. People will be dead. Okay. Uh, the last little thing is the solar wind, which I've talked about before. Uh, the sun is ejecting particles off, and there's a bubble around it, which is a heliopause. So that wraps up the sun. Uh, yeah, that's the sun. I gotta go turn this off.